Many decades ago, this area of Manhattan used to be one of the most densely populated areas in the entire world. The neighborhood was known at first as the Lower East Side. And then because it got so dense with different ethnic groups, it gained its own identity known as Little Italy. However, nowadays people know it as Nolita, which is a portmanteau of north of Little Italy. In these neighborhoods, you would be surrounded by businesses that look, would look like this and people crammed into tenements. You would hear the smells. You would hear the noises of kids running around the street and the smells of beautiful Italian cooking. However, amidst this beautiful neighborhood vibe was also a shadow, a shadow of the illegal crime dealings of the Mafia. And if we go further back into history, gangsters from Five Points and from Chinatown. Today we're going to tour through Little Italy and through Chinatown in order to learn the history of the Mafia. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, and let's go on a tour. Let me know where you're watching from. So we're starting right now at Elizabeth Street, right after Houston. And this is one of the few storefronts that survive from Little Italy's era. And now let's walk towards Prince Street and go to our very first stop on this tour through the Mafia history. But what is the Mafia? Well, for that, we have to go at least back to the 1800s, if not further, if people were to believe that the lore is correct. In the 1800s, Italy was recently reunified, or unified into one single country. This was a bit of an issue because today we think of Italians as this one homogeneous group. But if you've ever been to Italy and if you ever meet an Italian from Italy, you'll end up realizing the cultures are pretty different within the country itself. A lot of the North was the main manufacturing hub. So the North had a lot of the capital, a lot of the money, a lot of the real estate, a lot of the power. The South didn't. The South produced raw materials which were manufactured up in the north and then sold back into the south. Thus, they didn't have too much power. Especially further south you went, all the way to Sicily. In Sicily, the government barely cared about Sicily and there was barely a rule of law in the mid-1800s in Sicily. So, because of the fear of authority, the distrust with authority figures, maybe the police or politicians, there was a group that formed called La Cosa Nostra. And La Cosa Nostra means our thing in English. This is our modern day mafia. Because from the tiny little island of Sicily, making their crime dealings in the city of Palermo, many of those immigrants start sailing out across the Atlantic Ocean to cities like New York and establishing the extension of those crime families right over here. However, there are only one out of three main mafias that we know of today. The other one being Nangreta, might be mispronouncing that, it's a very hard word to pronounce, so they're from Calabria. And the other one being the Camorra, they are from Naples. This is our first stop. So here we have 8 and 9 Prince Street. Now, it doesn't quite look like anything associated with the Mafia. We can see it's in a tenement building, but now it uh, seems to be a place to get your ears pierced and the clothing store. But before this was ever a clothing store and an ear piercing shop, 
This was a spaghetti restaurant. Yep. A spaghetti restaurant that was the main headquarters and the place to do their criminal dealings of the very first mafia family of the U.S., the Morellos. This was Morello, the clutch hand, they called him, because he had a deformed hand. And with that deformed hand, a lot of Italians back in the mainland had a very terrible superstition. They distrusted people, and they were afraid of people with deformities uh, due to the various old superstitions of the old country. And thus, he was able to rule with fear. He was also a very good sharpshooter with his good hand. Morello sailed over here to the U.S. and established some petty crime. However, that petty crime grew in its operation when his half-brother joined the team. His name was Terranova, and he was known as the Artichoke King. He started putting his toes into the business of selling fruits and vegetables <laughs> and also uh, taking advantage through various modes of racketeering. So imagine a very, imagine a very kind of badass name known as the Artichoke King. Doesn't sound so badass. However, they were mostly small time petty thieves. They were really weren't doing anything. Um, they weren't really making that much money and they weren't really having too much influence outside the Italian neighborhoods of Little Italy and Little Italy in Harlem. And thus, a man came from Sicily. He is known as the very first godfather. This godfather was Vito Cassio Ferra. Vito Cassio Ferra is the one who established the real mafia here in New York City. He installed a code of honor. He also uh, made sure that they organized their system better. And thus, the real mafia of New York began right here with other characters like Lupo the Wolf, who owned a goods store or emporium right next door. But, in 1903, a barrel was found many blocks away on Avenue D in the modern day Alphabet City neighborhood. Inside this barrel, they saw the body of a man stuffed inside. Now, fair warning for anyone watching, if you usually watch with kids, this one of my few broadcasts where Viewer discretion is advised. I might talk about some grisly crimes. I won't get into too much detail. You can, if you're into that, you can find a lot more detail in other videos. Uh, but just viewer discretion advised. They end up finding that his throat was slashed from end to end. And he was stuffed into the barrel. This was one of the many barrel murders of 1903. And this was the inciting incident for New York City's law enforcement to finally get wind of what was happening in the underworld here in New York City. Let's go to our second stop. So hello everyone, let me know where you're watching from and slam that like button if you want to see more videos like this, and if you want to bring these tours to more people around the world. So you can imagine as we're walking around, this would have been filled to the brim with recent Italian immigrants. But why did Italians start coming here? As I mentioned, it was uh, due to Italian unification, left a lot of the South on the wayside. And since the South was left on the wayside, a lot of these immigrants were dirt poor. Thus, they immigrated in mass over here to cities like New York, uh, to Pennsylvania as well, uh, to Canada, like Toronto. Uh, one of the first cities that they end up also immigrating was actually New Orleans. 
and search for a new life. However, the Italians were much poorer than the previous immigrant group that came over here, the Irish. And they took a lot of the jobs from the Irish. This caused a discord between them, but also caused a rift with Americans that were born here. This is the Basilica of Old St. Patrick. And I think there's a tour group in front, so let me tell you the story here before we go inside. At one time, the Mafia ran most of New York City, says Matt. Yeah, Matt, it is, a, it is quite an interesting journey. So this is a basilica, and it's named the basilica because it is uh, deemed by the Pope as of historical importance for the Roman Catholic Church. But why is it so important? Well, this was established in 1809, and it was to serve the very beginnings of the Irish community over here in New York City. But then famine struck in Ireland. And with famine, many more millions of Irish started coming here into America. They also were extremely poor as the Italians came later. However, they were Catholic. And at that time, being Catholic was kind of odd in the US. Most of the US was either Protestant, Puritan, or Episcopal. But Catholic was seen as worshipping some foreign ruler, aka the Pope. And they didn't trust the Pope due to all the wars and all the political issues that happened in Europe centuries prior. Thus, in 1836, this was the victim of an attack by the so-called nativists. These were American-born Protestants who thought that the Irish were taking their jobs and also trying to install a foreign ruler, being the Pope, and thus they attacked the church. But at that time they called them the Gales, which were the Irish. They were prepared and they had a wall surrounding the church. And the bishop at that time, his name was John Hughes, who later is responsible for St. Patrick's Cathedral. He gave a very firm warning. He says, if this church is burned down, or any Catholic church is burned down in the, in the city, New York City will become Moscow. Meaning New York City will burn to the ground. Meaning that he will retaliate. Meaning that he would use his armed militia of Irishmen, yes, they were armed with muskets, to retaliate to the Protestants. That meant war. And within these walls, there's these little markings. Let me show it to you. So it's a bit hard to spot because it mostly has been filled in. But sometimes you see these dents that seems like there were bricks put later. These dents used to be holes that were used to shoot muskets at the Protestants coming here. So here we go. All right. So let's go much later. We'll get back to the Irish a little bit later in this tour. Let's go to a uh, young boy who became an altar boy here in the church. Altar boy helps out with various things during the mass and such. His name was Marty. His last name was Scorsese. Yep, Martin Scorsese, the famous director of many amazing films like Raging Bull, Wolf of Wall Street, Gangs of New York, worked right here as an altar boy. And he ended up using this church for two films, one of them being um, Mean Streets, where he had a pivotal scene with Harvey Cartel. 
And there's another film, I'll let you, everyone, to find out what's the other film that he featured inside this church. But there's a second famous film that was featured inside here. And that film, here's Mean Streets. That film was The Godfather. Cue the music during the baptism scene. Let's go inside. Let's take a peek, and then we'll go come back out. Mighty Bull, thank you so much for a super chat. I appreciate you, Mighty Bull. Beautiful church, isn't it? So you can imagine Vito, I mean Corleone, standing right over here. The scene is on YT, you can watch it, or you can watch the movie, The Godfather. And So there we go. Down here, there's a door, uh, there's an entranceway to the old crypt. There's a bishop under he underneath here as well. The crypt. Now the guys who attacked, wanted to attack the church. Uh, later, they were be known as the Bowery Boys, known for their top hats and known for being based around the Bowery. The glass break? Ask uh, Essa Fields? Yeah, it did. Yeah, I think it did. I think it did. Yeah, it did. Wow. Beautiful church. 
highly recommend coming here. It's a basilica. There's a lot of history in this graveyard dealing with the Irish who were veterans of the Civil War as well. Uh, this is a very historic graveyard, also featured in many films. A few films also uh, starring, um, I think, Robert De Niro as well. He has a scene like here. All right, everyone, slam that like button and let me know if you're on Team Like. Let's bring this tour to more people. And let me know if you have any questions. We're going to zigzag our way through little Italy and see more of this neighborhood. And let me know if you have any stories <laughs> of encountering mafiosos. Uh, I don't. I grew up in the 90s. You know, it was really at least not so visible as a little kid in my area of Jackson Heights. Uh, it was more like Colombian drug cartel. That was a little bit more visible in my neighborhood. Uh, but let me know. Hey, uh, Ronald. Uh, Mun says, oh, you had a... Uh, your mother, how was she involved? Um, can you repeat the name of the Basilica? Old St. Patrick's. Basilica of Old St. Patrick's. As opposed to St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was kind of the updated version of this. This, since St. Patrick's Cathedral was built, this was just considered a parish for many decades. But the Pope uh, made it into a basilica I think about 20, 30 years ago around there. Maybe a little bit less. I think it was about 10 or so years ago. My mother is definitely from the Mafia, says oh, Mon. <laughs> oh, Mon, interesting. <laughs> Any interesting stories? The Barry boys, what? What did they do in the church? Uh, they wanted to attack. That's why there's a huge wall. Went to the catacombs there, says Krista. Ooh, cool. What makes a church a basilica? A basilica basically is a place of historic importance for the Roman Catholic Church. So the Pope has to ordain a basilica. It could be literally any type of church. There, there are basilicas that are tiny little churches like this one. There's basilicas that are gigantic churches like the one in the Vatican City. Um, there could literally be a basilica anywhere. But I think there's usually only one per city, if I'm correct. There's a man uh, from Sullivan Street, further north, called Vinny the Chin. He would pretend to be mentally ill. He was a big boss. The community feared him, but he also protected them. Oh, interesting, Cynthia. Oh, I love that story. In Palermo, it's not so easy living, especially political. Right, right. And it's a glorious looking church. I agree. So here we are at one of the most famous streets for Little Italy, still the modern Little Italy that people visit today as tourists. Probably that tour group is going later down this street. What street is this? Let me know in the comments. I want to test everyone. Christine says you have to have a cathedral to become a city, says Christine. Uh, I may be in the Roman Catholic sense, but definitely not in the U.S. because... Uh, the U.S. is not a Roman Catholic nation. It's a secular nation. Suzanne says, good looks and brains too. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. Thank you. I have logs. Nice to see you here. Prince? Grant? Oh, no. This is Mulberry, as the name is, uh, of the market. I'll show you the street sign over here. Mulberry, right there. Matt says, don't know much about uh, mafia or gangsters. Brainer says, don't know much about mafia or gangsters. That's why you're watching the tour. Oh, cool. So, yeah, this is historic Mulberry Street. This was the heart of Little Italy. All the way since Italians started coming here, 1870s. They started really coming here in droves by the 1890s, and that's where the Morello started taking over. But right here, 
was this place. Let's pull out a photo. <laughs> I'm also I'm uh, I'm almost perfectly placed proportionally. Let me uh, actually make the proportions a little bit more real. There we go. Look at this. Almost proportionally placed in, with this photograph. This looks like any normal storefront. But 1926. You know, you remember that guy Morello that we showed earlier? Well, his cohorts the ones who succeeded him opened up the Knights of the Alto Social Club. This place hosted many people of the likes like Lucky Luciano. Lucky Luciano is probably one of the more famous gangsters of the 1920s and 30s. I'll pull up a photo of him right here. Where's Lucky? Right here. So that's Lucky right over there. He was also associated with guys like Al Capone as well, who also got their start here in New York City, but Al Capone was more based in Brooklyn. Now, Lucky Luciano even testified in um, Congress, if I'm correct. However, something happened. Uh, due to a lot of things with the Mafia, it gets really complicated, so pardon me if I get uh, the families a little bit mixed up at times because uh, the family names are not always the actual last surnames of the mobsters and gangsters. But due to a lot of different dealings, um, they end up killing Anastasia. And Anastasia, after him, the Gambino family took over. And the Gambino, when they took over, it was established by, this was converted into the Ravenite Club. And when it became the Ravenite Club, the guy who was the underboss of the Gambinos was this guy with the white hair. His name was Neil De La Croce. People know him, knew him as, mo as basically Mr. Neil. That was his name. Many police officers when they looked him in the eye, they said that he was one of the most terrifying people that they ever met. They didn't say that to most gangsters or most mafiosos. But to this guy, they, sh they made him shiver to the core. The guy right next to him was his underling, his, men his mentee. In a way, almost like his son. Not due to... Fam uh, familial blood relation, but an adopted son, in a way. His name was John Gotti. When Gambino got arrested, he ended up promoting basically the businessman of the operation. His name was Paul Castellano, and this pissed off John Gotti. But Della Croce, who was still underboss, who still managed a lot of the gangsters on the streets refuse to complain or to say anything about Paul Castellano and he told all of his underlings including the John Gotti to stand down. But why did they hate Paul Castellano? And he's, he's appeared in a recent series I haven't seen yet. Um, well, the reason they hated Paul Castellano was because he was more in tune with white collar crime. He really didn't know too much about the streets, according to John Gotti and many other people in the Gambino crime family. He also really didn't care about continuing racketeering businesses and gambling businesses, and especially the very, very profitable heroin business. He put a full stop to selling heroin. This was really concerning for John Gotti because he knew how much money they were laying on the wayside with heroin. So, Mr. Neal, as Gambino uh, passes away, oh, as Gambino's arrested, 
Della Croce passes away from lung cancer. And when he passes away from lung cancer, finally John Gotti can start gathering his own underlings in order to take down Castellano. And thus, John Gotti forms a hit on Castellano and takes him out. He is now the new crime boss of New York City, the head of the Gambino family. John Gotti is the number one. But this was the mid-80s, and by the mid-80s, New York City was having enough of the Mafia. They had enough of it. They did not want to entertain the Mafia anymore. A guy was in charge as district attorney, Rudy Giuliani, hey, uh, was in charge, Rudy Giuliani, and he was fierce. So, they end up putting bugs into the Ravenite Club, where he used to hang out. And let me show you uh, what he ended up doing, because they end up bugging his room. So bugs, I mean, uh, they started putting microphones and also surveillance. So this photo was taken by a neighbor of his that lived right in front. Uh, she was not related with Mafia or anything. Uh, she was just a journalist. And she snapped this photo very quickly. And right there in the center is Gambino. And this is the Ravenite Club. He ended up actually bricking over the gloss facade so he can maintain privacy. But Gambino was still a very cocky man. And he would be out there chilling as if nothing was happening. Thus, he had his shiny white shoes, his uh, white jeans, and his striped shirt as well. You see it there? You can pass. Yeah, you can pass. Right there. Now, the guy, when, uh, when the woman took the photo, the journalist, uh, the guy was uh, uh, screaming at her, Hey, don't sell this. Don't sell this. Don't sell this. <laughs> he was also a short man. Yeah, I think he was a bit shorter. Yeah, he was on the shorter side. Uh, here's Gotti. But the FBI had a whole lot of surveillance on him. And this is the surveillance that they put right next door, filming the entrance of the Raven Night Club. So you can see them, he, him chatting with his mafio seat. So wait a minute. Um, did they get anything? No. <laughs> all the recordings inside the main area were all just chit chat. It wasn't talking anything about the crime dealings of the Mafia. So they couldn't implicate him. However, what John Gotti was doing is that he was moving right next door. He had a secret entranceway to go to the next tenement building. In the hallway, that's where he would talk all about his crime dealings. The FBI got wind of that. And they end up bugging, putting microphones and also video on the hallway and that's where they got him in 1992 john gotti was convicted here's a news clipping once again john gotti faces the prospect of life in prison with prior felony convictions for attempted manslaughter and truck hijacking he could face a stiff prison term as a persistent felon if convicted a third time in an unusual move, the judge in this case has ordered the jury sequestered throughout the trial. Gotti has avoided conviction on felony charges twice in the past four years. In opening statements this time, the assistant DA accused Gotti of having a carpenter's union official shot over a dispute regarding a restaurant operated by the Gambino crime family. This man, John Gotti, the head of the Gambino family, ordered that assault. The union official, John O'Connor, was shot four times in the legs and buttocks. The prosecution says it has tapes of Gotti giving orders to co-defendant Anthony Grieri 
to take care of O'Connor. John Gotti say O'Connor must be busted up. Gotti's attorney says this case is the most significant of the past 50 years. And he chided the government for spending more money on chasing Gotti than on the homeless who surrounded the court building. You ladies and gentlemen will get the opportunity to balance the decent and fair play ideals we have against what I submit to you is a modern day vendetta, persecution, and witch hunt. When the trial recessed, Gotti had no comment for the media, but his attorney amplified on his opening statements. I think John Gotti has been the, the, the most noteworthy figure in the last 50 years. And, and that's why, I, and I think it, he, because of the vendetta, and because of the cases we've had, it's put the American system on trial. The trial resumes on Monday morning. The first testimony will come from Vinny the Fish Caparo, a former underworld figure who's now testifying on behalf of the prosecution. Normally, a trial of this nature would last five to six weeks, but the judge in this case promises no more than three weeks. He has scheduled six-day-a-week trial sessions. Brian Madden for CNN in New York. So that, that was a news report from CNN back in the day. Uh, it does look very old. Yeah, yeah, it looks so classic, so classic. Um, since then, the Raven 8 Club has obviously become a different business. It's now a shoe store. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's now a shoe store. <laughs> However, inside the shoe store, uh, the owner gets inundated with questions about uh, John Gotti and the Mafia because it actually has a remnant of those era which I'll show right over here. I won't go inside because I want to respect the store, but here is the original flooring of the store. And according to the owner, one time she ended up getting a Japanese tourist coming over here and asking, hey, hey could, can I buy a piece of the floor? <laughs> and she was so weirded out by it. And he offered her $400. And he actually bought a piece of the floor. So that's the shoe store right here. And I think John Gotti probably would approve of these shoes. Yeah. A lot of photo bombers here, yeah, indeed. The defense languages sound uh, bizarre, uh, says Rebel Poe. Yeah, yeah, indeed. This is like the episode of The Twilight Zone, says uh, Kurt. Oh, why is that, Kurt? Gotti was called the Teflon Don because he was a very handsome and impeccably dressed all the time. Indeed he was. He wore $2,000 suits. Now one thing as we're walking around and talking about this mafia history, I don't mean to romanticize the history of these guys at all. Um, it is a real reality that they were involved in very heinous crimes and also in uh, terrible deeds that I definitely don't approve of as my personal opinion. Um, so my intention is not to romanticize, is merely to just give you a tour. Here, right above this uh, yellow storefront was the home of De La Croce, the most feared man in the mafia, who was the mentor of good old John Gotti. And now let's walk through one of my favorite restaurants, actually. This is one of my favorite brunch places, Ruby's. Highly recommend it. Packed to the brim today. Oh, my God. I avoid this place on weekends because it's so packed. Wanda says, thank you for the story. It's still fascinating what you do. Oh, I'm so glad. All right, we got a little bit more for our next stop. All right, let's cross. Whoa. All right, so. Praying for, paying for your protection when they were who you needed protecting from. 
Right, right, right. It's a, it's a much more complicated issue. And actually, we're gonna, on our next stop, you're going to learn how it's... Um, the Mafia also had a very dark side that affected common people. Uh, we're going to learn about that very soon. So now we're turning on Spring Street and we're going to go down Lafayette. Hey, Ronald says, give a YouTuber an offer he can't refuse by giving him a like. Indeed. Indeed. Ronald, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, shout out from LA. Gyro says, the boss of the Gambinos was shot like two years ago and was replaced by another guy. Technically, the boss is some 80-year-old guy, rumor has it. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know, Gyro. All right, let's go here. We're gonna go right down there soon, but first let's go here. So the mafia doesn't exist anymore, says AR? Um, actually, I'll tell you something very interesting. I'll answer that question in a more roundabout way to show, kind of change your perception. That's a great question. So does the mafia exist anymore? The Mafia was significantly cracked down on in Italy, uh, mostly due to the rampant kidnappings that were happening due to the Nangretta. Uh, again, I might be mispronouncing that. And um, there was also a shootout with the Camorra in Naples, and there was uh, increasing tensions and political maneuverings that were happening in Palermo and Sicily. So uh, it was getting very nasty by the 1970s and the 1980s that uh, Italy cracked down and arrested hundreds of mafiosos. Uh, but they had a challenge in the beginning while trying to crack down on these guys. So when trying to crack down on the mafiosos, people in 1960s, 1970s Italy would say the mafia doesn't exist. People in uh, the government will also say, what are you talking about? The mafia doesn't exist. It's a conspiracy. Here in America, people would say the same thing. The mafia doesn't exist. Maybe, maybe there's a few gangsters, but there's no mafia. There's no boss. There's no godfather. It exists. It's the stuff of movies. Stuff that Francis Ford Coppola made up. You know, stuff that Scarface has made up or, or whatnot. It's made up by those guys doesn't exist. And they would make you think that it is literally a conspiracy. Like Freemasons or, or, or Knights Templar or uh, I don't know, what, what, whatever, the CIA LSD experiments. They would make you think it is a straight conspiracy. That was due to one quirk of the Mafia Code. It's called, or not quirk, it was actually a, a very intentional, the, probably the most important code of the Mafia, called omerta. And omerta means that you don't talk to police, you, don't spe you're, you cannot be seen hanging out with the police, you cannot talk to other mafiosos unless you're introduced by that other mafioso by someone higher than you. So even mafiosos couldn't relate to each other. And also they had a code of honor when it related to uh, treating uh, their wives and their families with respect and other things and their community and et cetera and the church. So with Amurta, there was very little communication, open communication happening. And that's why there was such a big, big denial of the mafia ever existing. So people just said it was a conspiracy. It's very interesting because I feel like history might be repeating itself with some certain things. Because the same thing happened when CIA and LSD experiments, which were later proven to be true in the late 90s. People just said it's a conspiracy, and look, it actually happened. Um, but we do know, like CIA's uh, um, questionable means of experimentation, same thing with the mafia. It was proven to be real. 
and it was taken down really significantly in Italy and also taken down significantly with John Gotti in 1992 when he was arrested. But let's go way back to 1890s to early 1900s to 1903. I mentioned the barrel murders where a guy was stuffed into a barrel by, again, this guy. Morello, very first mafia boss of New York City. Well, the person who ended up caught, uh, catching Morello was one of the most feared NYPD officers of the early 1900s. He was the very first Italian-American to serve in the police force ever in the entire United States history. Most of the police at that time here in New York City were Irish-Americans. So. They quite did not like having him on the force, but they had to do something with the Italian community because they were being terrorized. Also by this guy, not because he was stuffing people to barrels. The person he stuffed into barrels were other mafiosos or other corrupt uh, businessmen, but he was also involved in something called the Black Hand. That guy looks like Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine. Oh, interesting. That is interesting. So this was the Black Hand. And the cop that we're talking about is what this park is named after. His name is Lieutenant Joseph Petrosino. He was born in 1860 in Padula, Italy. And he died in 1909 in Palermo, Sicily. This is Petrosino right over here. Now, Petrosino was only about 5'3". And at that time, there was a height restriction. In the NYPD, they had to be at least 5'7". They ended up making an exception for one very important reason. He was actually fluent in many dialects in Italian. So he knew Sicilian, he knew uh, the Naples dialect, he also knew the Calabrian dialect and he knew a bunch of other dialects. He was battling a criminal ring that was sending these letters to Italian Americans. As I mentioned, most Italian Americans moving here were very poor. They didn't have too much resources, but the few resources they had were being swindled out of their fingers because they will receive a threatening letter with a knife cutting through a black hand saying, give us your money or we will break your arm. The letters end up getting more and more threatening and more and more creative and more and more filled with different images. Here are all the different images that they would have. So not just breaking your arm, they will stuff you in a barrel, shoot you and stuff you in a barrel. They would stab your heart, or they just might decapitate you. So Italians paid up, and um, after they paid up, they would ask for more. The worst crimes that mostly happened were breaking of arms and legs and, and beatings, and also bombings, cue the sirens. The Black Hand was involved in a few bombings around the city as they were threatened business owners. Well, the Black Hand was also kidnapping children and family members. So Petrosino had to do something. So this guy was in deep cover. He was also known as a master of disguise. He was so into his police work that if he were to come across his own daughter on the street, he was known to not acknowledge her in the least bit, as if he never knew her. You would say, oh, it's because this guy is a terrible, terrible, terrible father. No, it's because he was protecting his daughter. He did not want his daughter's identity to be public. He wanted to make sure no one knew who she was so he can continue fighting crime. But who was the Black Hand? Well, the Black Hand 
is a bit like the mafia. There's a bunch of different families and different organizations associated with it, but kept getting bigger because the Black Hand kept getting more famous. There was more stories related to the Black Hand. Well, one of the people involved in the Black Hand was our guy Morello. And back in Italy, after Morello was arrested for the barrel murders, here's all the other guys that were arrested for the barrel murders. It's a big list. Look at all those guys. <laughs> a lot of mustaches back then. A lot of mustaches. Um, and this is the depicting what the barrel murder was and a few signs of who the guy was. After they were all sent to prison, our guy Vito Cassioferra, the godfather from Sicily, fled back to Sicily. But he still had his hand in the Black Hand. He still had his hand in the forming of mafias all around the United States of America. So Joe Petrosino sets up an Italian squad and that Italian squad is six guys. Here's a photo with a few of them and one of the main mafiosos in the center. This Italian squad was also had a guy who was expert in disarming bombs, making it the very first bomb squad of America as well. They knew Italian, they snuck in to parties, they snuck into the neighborhoods, they snuck in to mafia uh, dealings. They were cracking down with the hammer. Now remember this building because this building we're actually going to walk through it soon. So what happens with Joseph Betosino? He's battling the Black Hand. What, what can he do? The Black Hand keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger with more and more threats. They end up getting more and more connections. Well, he knows he can do one, one thing. He can go to Sicily to gather information on Cassioferra and the other Sicilian Cosa Nostra who had who were basically the main men, the godfathers, the bosses of bosses. If he got information from them, he would be able to come back to America, bring it over here, and finally take him down for good. So he went over to Sicily, asked for permission to have Secret Service accompany him. The United States refused because he was Italian. They said, no, we're not going to help you. You're on your own. So he went on his own to Palermo. And in Palermo, Sicily, he ended up having dinner. And Cassioferra, who was also having dinner a few blocks away, got wind that Petrosino was there. It was his first day in Palermo. Cassioferra excused himself from his family. And according to legend, no one knows this 100% for sure. But I prefer this story because I think it's a more dramatic one. It's the one that would make a better movie. Cassioferra excuses himself from his family, goes out, Someone, one of his henchmen tells Petrosino that there's an informant that has a very vital, important information about the Cosa Nostra, meet him at a random street alley corner of Palermo. And he goes over there himself, Casio Ferra, takes out his gun, and shoots Petrosino a few times. Police were right next door from Sicily, didn't do anything. Witnesses saw the crime. One witness said there was like multiple shooters. There was two or three. Another witness said it was some random dude. Another witness said it was some random thief. Another witness said, I didn't see anything. It's because Ormerta was deeply entrenched in the Italian community because there was a distrust for the authorities. So even in the Italian communities, the very Italian Americans did not complain about the black hand and in Sicily they did not snitch. They were also probably afraid of the Mafia as well, so they didn't want to snitch on the Mafia and be implicated. So no one knew, knows exactly what happened to Petrosino. We only know that he was shot to death in Palermo. His uniform is still on display in Sicily. He's the only 
NYPD officer, or basically the only police officer in America who has died in foreign territory, trying to save his own community from destruction, from the terrorism of the Black Hand. His own community, part of it at least, hated him. But many decades later, people end up seeing that he was a model Italian-American trying to really help the community move forward and legitimately. So tell me this, Martin Scorsese, if you're watching, wouldn't this make a great film? <laughs> so that is Petrosino. Let's go, that's the little park over here. And let's go to our next stop. Wendy says, oh, super, so interesting. Wow, such a brave man. I agree, he's really a brave man. That would make such an amazing uh, movie. And actually, Martin Scorsese did uh, option the rights to a book about his life. So it may happen. The book, I think it's called The Black Hand. I forgot who the author was. <laughs> Pay or Die was a Petrosino movie. Yeah, I heard Merck. I heard it was a, a, lot of, a lot of people who are history buffs said that it's not so accurate. I haven't seen it yet, though. 25,000 people joined Petrosino's funeral. They did. Um, he was very well loved in the community. More loved than even other famous Italian Americans at that time. So right over here, we have the old New York Police Department headquarters. The Inspired says I should direct it. Hey, uh, we have a super chat. Who is this? Uh, Mirna, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you. And if anyone else left the super chat, do let me know. Sometimes when I do these history broadcasts, I really get into the uh, flow of storytelling. So I might miss Super Chats, but do let me know if you Super Chatted. And now I'll, I'll leave a, a, a 10 minute Q&A at the end. And I'll do my best to answer any questions. So, this building right here, the New York Police Department building. Oh, and actually I was gonna ask people. Someone said I should direct the, uh, the Inspired Life says I should direct the movie about Joe Petosino fighting the black hand. Let me know. <laughs> I'll let Marty do it if he wants to do it first, but I don't know. Marty seems pretty busy, so I don't know. I'll, I can do it. I can do it. I think I can do it. <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll be one of the characters in it as well. <laughs> um, this was the police headquarters from 1909 all the way to 1973. Now, this is a beautiful Beau Arts building. Spencer says, yes, if I could get casted. <laughs> All right, Spencer, send me your headshot. <laughs> Wait, we have, a, we have another actor who's also a, a, a YTer uh, who does history tours. His name is Tom Delgado, and he's also an actor. Should Tom Delgado be like one of uh, Petrosino? If Tom Delgado gains weight, he could be Petrosino himself. <sighs> Mind blown. Mind blown. Everyone let Tom Delgado know. If he wants the Petrosino role, he got it. So back to our, our, our huge fortress, the castle in the middle of little Italy. This was uh, built by architects Hopin and Cohen in 1909 in the Beaux-Arts style. Beaux-Arts is like a kind of a mishmash of classical elements, maybe Roman, Greek, etc. Like Cardinal says, I can act in it too. I'm Italian. Oh, great, great. That's awesome. Mighty Bull, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate it. Yes, direct it. I will watch it, says uh, Wanda. Beautiful couple. Yeah, look at that. 
Wow. So this is where Petrosino used to work. Right over here. He used to work right over here. Now, why did Petrosino become so influential as a police officer? Well, it was actually because he was friends with the police commissioner at that time. You might know his name. Theodore Roosevelt. Yep. The man who eventually became U.S. president. He was good friends with Joe Petrosino. So, do I have the mustache for Teddy? Maybe. Maybe I do. <laughs> Maybe I have the mustache for Teddy. Um, is it snowy? No, it's not snowy. It's just water trickling down. Now, this was a state-of-the-art police department because they had a very elaborate phone system. Marianne, thank you so much for the five... 100 stars, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Is the police still in that building? Oh, wait for that, wait for that. We'll talk about that very, very soon. Um, so this was had a very elaborate phone system. Here's what they called the nerve of the police department. Also, they had these tiny little index cards, which they would put up in the around the main lobby area and they had names of all the guys we've been talking about Giuseppe Morello, Vito Cassioferra, um, Lucky Luciano, etc. Name goes on. We're gonna learn about a few other characters that might have been on that list as well. Well this was called the Rogues Gallery and so no it is not an invention by Batman or uh, there was another major superhero that had a rogues gallery. Nope, it's not an adventure by Batman. It's actually a real thing. But is this still a police headquarters? Well, in the 1970s, they ended up vacating the building because it was uh, too old to modernize. And it stayed vacant until 1988 when it became something else. Now, there's something that is... I, I gotta say this quietly. There's something more terrifying than the Black Hand. There's something more terrifying than even Cassioferra, the Godfather. I would be even more terrified of this thing than even coming across a uh, white-shoed John Gotti. What do you think this building is now? It's a very terrifying prospect. It makes a lot of old-school New Yorkers shiver with fear that their city is being lost. No, it's not the IRS. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> uh, says uh, Eugen, no. Um, not the IRS. Not the IRS, everyone. Voldemort. No, not Voldemort. Uh, and no, no, it's not associated with uh, the one who not, shall not be mentioned. He does not own this building. No, no, no. It's not him. It's not the, the orange Voldemort. Um, this is associated with something more terrifying. Marianne has said it. You got to say it very quietly. These are condos. Okay, I'm safe. The developers haven't come and got me yet. Okay, good. But these are condos. These condos are one of the most lavish condos in all of New York City. Sought after for their lavish digs. You can live inside the dome if you wanted to. Right over here, there's a few photos and have these beautiful views of Manhattan. They even eat avocado toast in these condos. Dare I say, do they have a mimosa in these condos? Now, the price for these condos, I doubt even a John Gotti could have afforded this. Um, it would be a very big expense, at least for him. Cost $11.6 million 
for that penthouse. So, there we go. Some things are more scarier than even the Cosa Nostra is development. <laughs> Dare I say, gentrification. All right, let's continue moving. Maybe gentrification is like Cosa Nostra, it doesn't exist. It's like politicians, you mentioned gentrification, they were like, what? Wait, that, what, what are you talking about? It doesn't exist. All right, let's cross the street. Let's take a closer look. And I'll, I'll show you the beautiful views right down there of the skyline. Is it for sale? I don't think so at the moment. No, I don't think at the moment it's for sale. All right, we got to cross the street fast. With or without parking? I actually don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Great question, I don't know for sure. They got a deal they couldn't refuse indeed. I'll show you the front, which is really cool because they have these uh, lions, very similar to the New York Public Library as well. We'll peek into the lobby for real quickly. Let's see if we can actually see it. Any famous people live here? There's a few. I don't know off the top of my head. If anyone could let us know, do a quick Google search. Let us know who's the famous people that live here. There's a few. And let's peek in. And I'll go very slowly. There's usually heavy security here, so I won't get too close to the window. Cindy Crawford, thank you. That was one of them. Yeah, Cindy Crawford. Lion statues, cars, beautiful Ariel. Yeah, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. The lion looks like he's about to sneeze. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And here is where they probably held Giuseppe Morello. Right down here. And his other gangsters, maybe Lucky Luciano maybe served some time here. P being processed. What street? This is um, Lafayette and Center. This is Center Street. Center Street. Yeah, Center Street. Center and Grand Street is the intersection. Just tell them Don Ariel would like to visit for five minutes with 738 friends. Wow, we got 738 people tuning in right now. That's amazing. Everyone, thank you so much for slamming that like button. Just like these mafiosos <laughs> slam their uh, their defense during a court trial so hard that they always acquitted them. <laughs> uh, slam that like button and let us know if you want to learn more stories. I got like, I can easily go for like about three more stops and the story gets even more epic as we go further back in time. Do you want to continue going? Let me know. If you want me to continue going, I will. If you're on part of Team Like. Slap that like button. Yeah, slap that like button. Slap it like they would slap a wise guy. <laughs> Let's keep it clean over here. We'll talk about slapping. Slap that like button like they would slap a wise guy. Let me know if you want me to continue going. First, let's admire beautiful architecture. Team like uh, Deb, Eugen says, what do you think? Do you want to stream more? I do. Yes, I definitely do. Uh, Kevin says, do carry on, my good man. Uh, Thomas says, team like, yes, Petter. Yes. Thank you, Petter. What style of architecture is this? That's Beaux-Arts. Beaux-Arts. So, there's something interesting here. Right here. My shadow. Don't worry, it's not that scary. I'm not part of the Cosa Nostra, don't worry. Or am I? No, no, I'm not. 
Uh, that's what Cosa Nostra would say. Right underneath our feet is a tunnel. This tunnel led from the NYPD headquarters in the 1920s during Prohibition. For anyone who doesn't know, Prohibition is was the time where the U.S. illegalized alcohol. So it was illegal to consume or to sell alcohol. They had a tunnel going all the way down, all the way down, all the way down over here to a secret door in this bar called O'Neill's now. But back then in the 1920s, this bar was a speakeasy. So the police officers drank after work. They arrested people during the day, drinking. People selling that alcohol, they would arrest them. And then they would have a nice drink to wind down. After all that cracking down on alcohol, they would wind down with another drink. <laughs> Goes to show how uh, there is a, I would say, contradictory behavior on both ends of the spectrum, both cops and robbers. There's a double standard, says Dave. Yes, you can say that. There's a little double standard. Uh, also, this is the bar where uh, I was featuring Sex and the City as Scout. And Carrie visits here uh, to uh, kind of re reunite with Aiden. And uh, this is one of the stops at the Sex and the City tour, and they do sell a very good Cosmopolitan. But this is not a Sex and the City tour, this is a Mafia tour. So let's go back to the nitty gritty of New York. Let's go back on Mulberry. Hey, Barry. Great show. Please wish a happy birthday to Trisha. Oh, yeah. Trisha, happy birthday. Thank you so much, Barry, for the super chat. Trisha, have a very, very happy birthday from New York City's Little Italy. I hope you're enjoying it. Everyone wish uh, Trisha a happy birthday. I love when people watch uh, on special days. That's so awesome. I'm very honored that you're spending this time. Oldest she shop, great. Mozzarella. Mozzarella. Uh, and great Meatball Heroes. Hello from Nova Scotia, welcome. So a lot of restaurants here, lots of historic restaurants still open to this day. Here's the oldest pastry shop in New York City, Ferrara. And there's a lot of history here beyond just mafia history. Um, another thing to keep aware is that we're only talking about a tiny little sliver of Italian-American history. Italian-American history, unfortunately, at least in cinema, has way more movies about the Mafia than about other um, professions or more le legitimate uh, families and uh, just normal people. They don't have too many movies about them, but don't, uh, don't be swayed by that. Don't think that that is representative of the community because it isn't. Not everyone was a mafioso, it was just a tiny little portion. And it just happens that a lot of tours and movies focus on that because uh, frankly, it's easier to focus on those topics because there are people like scandal. There's something with human nature that we all like scandal to a certain degree. So here's the Christmas store, and there's an Earth Cam here, I think. But I don't know where it is. So someone's watching me on Earth Cam. Hey, say hello to little Frankie and Paul at Gro uh, Goto Asura. Oh, yeah, we might pass past Goto Asura. Thank you. Yeah. They're all, uh, I, I'm not sure about ghost stories. I don't know. I was trying. I was a bit hard pressed to find a ghost story. I bet there might be, but I don't know where to look. 
I couldn't find them. Are you going inside? No, no, not going inside. This is a mafia tour, not a Christmas tour. Team like as well for for Yoli. Susan just saw me on the Earth Cam. Oh, amazing! And here we go. The beautiful restaurant we actually passed by during the snowstorm. Um, one well, of the few restaurants open during a snowstorm. Here is Da Ginato, named after the famous festival that takes place here as well. Hmm, interesting. Unmarked vehicle with two big guys inside. Everyone, that is a bit interesting. <laughs> what, what does it mean when you see a big black vehicle with tainted, with uh, tinted windows and two large men in suits. What does that mean? What does that mean when you see a big GMC truck with two guys in big black suits? Let me know. What's your theories? Like literally, like right here, like right here. Anyways, uh, this is actually a quite a appropriate encounter because it relates to what happened here. April 7th, 1972. There was a man by the name of Crazy Joe Gallo. Crazy Joe Gallo, another mafioso. Many people believe that he was responsible for the murder of Joe Colombo, who was another mafioso, very high up in the ranks. Well, Crazy Joe Gallo was celebrating his uh, birthday over here after seeing a show of Don Rickles. Don Rickles had quite a bit of mafioso friends. He was actually invited to come over uh, to celebrate with him after the show. But after the show, he went with Jerry Orbach, famous actor from Law and & Order and a bunch of other uh, different um, shows. Let me know if you recognize Jerry Orbach from any other show. He partied up with Crazy Joe Gallo. He was there with his family at the Copacabana. After a long night partying at 4.30 a.m., they decided to have some dinner and some late night wine. And thus they came over to a new restaurant that was opened up here named Umberto's Clam House. Now let me show you how it looked like. This is how it looked like. This restaurant was only open for a few months. And it's actually still open. It's a little bit further down the block. And this would have been a normal dinner. Now one thing you should know is that uh, the mafiosos have quite a strict code of honor. And that code of honor is that they don't mess with other people's families. Contrary to what you might see in certain films or what you might see with other mafias from around the world. So Joe Gallo was relaxed inside this restaurant having a good time. A guy walks in through this door. Gallo is somewhere sitting around here with his family. He also has his bodyguard right there, another big guy with a black suit. The guy comes inside, takes a quick look, shoots the bodyguard in the leg, I think, or the arm to disable him, and then shoots Crazy Joe Gallo. Crazy Joe Gallo is coming out the window disabled, uh, crying for help, and he shoots him dead. The guy gets into a vehicle and drives away. This murder shocked New York City due to its very, very gruesome nature. Uh, the only uh, person dead was Gallo. Uh, the bodyguard was uh, significantly injured. The family wasn't harmed, but they saw the murder right in front of their eyes. Something very rare in the Mafia world. And this is why the Mafia started taking a more darker turn uh, during that era in the 70s. 
Now, one guy who actually claimed to do this murder was a man by the name of the Irishman. They actually made a movie. You want to take out the bodyguard And first. there's a scene where they depict him, him coming don't in kill him, just to the place. Him. But people yeah, don't no think it was him, really him. So people think he was mostly chest. exaggerating. Sometimes with something like this, you, you might want to go. And we'll show you the full scene, but that it is. So that uh, happened right here. And to this day, uh, people still visit Umberto's Climb House due to the association with that heinous crime. Um, but yeah, that was a rarity with the mafia. As far as I can tell from my research, that they really didn't involve the families of their um, vendettas, especially when they, um, you know, murdered them. They would not you know, do it in front of their families, at least here in New York City. I think it also started taking a very dark turn also in Italy because it started putting car bombs in these, uh, in these mafia hits as well. So uh, as I mentioned, it gets very heinous. So Crazy Joe Gallo actually was very pissed off that he was being played uh, by a comedian. Yeah. Joe Gallo was played by comedian Sebastian Maniscalco. Uh, and the Irishman. Oh, cool. But he was actually played by a comedian before then. Uh, there was a movie that was making fun of Crazy Joe Gallo. He had a vendetta against that as well. So they claim to have a code. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Ronald says that he actually ran out to save his family. I doubt that the family was going to be uh, implicated or, uh, you know, uh, harmed. I doubt that was the intention, but maybe you're right. I don't know for sure, but maybe you're right. And now we're passing through one of the canopied restaurants here. There's some people eating some good old school Italian food. All right, we got two more stops. Hola Jason, saludos, me encanta tu video, siempre conoce algo nuevo o son muy agradables. Esto para sales no me perdió ningún directo. Oh, qué bien. Jason loves his, these videos, says he's having a good time. Pro tip, this is a very great pizzeria called Manera's Pizza. And it's named after the main character of Saturday Night Fever, played by John Travolta. Great cannolis here at Ferrada Bakery. And... Lots of uh, other amazing businesses all around here. It's amazing. Uh, any coffee places there? Yeah, there's plenty of coffee places all around here. Yeah. Christina says, dude, he died on his birthday. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that this was a... Uh, when you talk about mafia and gangsters, it's going to get dark, unfortunately. I think you can't really sanitize this type of history. If you do sanitize it, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's not something I really would want to do. Um, sanitize it completely. So that's why. That's why I mentioned that story. Here we have Canal Street. Hey, Alexandra is asking, well, I like an Americano. I actually am getting pretty hungry, but no food for this broadcast, just a history tour. Now we are going towards Canal Street and passing into Chinatown. Chinatown actually extends beyond Canal, uh, North Canal Street, also uh, on Mott Street, but in terms of Mulberry, it starts really becoming Chinatown after Canal, south of Canal. So, love watching you. Uh, one of the best commuters gives the best interesting history. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. All right, so why is it called Canal Street? Let me know, everyone. Sunshine says, maybe a cigar. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, why is it called Canal Street?
Why do you think, everyone? Why would it be called Canal Street? Nobu and Gorgon is right, and first name and a bunch of other people are right, Alexis as well. There used to be a canal. New York City is not so creative with its names as you would like to think. If something's called that, it probably was that. So Canal Street right here literally was a canal. There's actually a great YouTube uh, video of an urban explorer. I forgot the name of the video, but search Urban Explorer New York City. This is a documentary where he takes a filmmaker with him and they go down into the sewers underneath Canal Street. And the canal seems to be running in the same direction. And uh, Urban Explorer says, water never truly goes away. So what was it draining? Well, what we're standing on right now. This here south of Canal Street was water. It was a massive pond. One of the most bucolic places in all of Manhattan, the largest body of water inside this island. This pond, people loved hanging out here. The rich New Yorkers who lived below Chambers Street in the 1700s would come over here and have a nice summer day. Maybe swimming in the pond, maybe uh, taking their families and uh, setting up camp. There was even the first steamboat experiment was done in this pond. It was the biggest source of fresh water as well, Chet Chet. Yes, you're right. This is what it used to look like. We would be looking at this view if we were standing here in the early 1700s. Here is the first steamboat experiment done on Collect Pond. And here's the main area of Collect Pond, about 60 feet deep. It got down too. There should be a pond street. No, I don't think there is a pond street. Just a canal street. So what happened? Why did Collect Pond? Why is it not here? Why are we walking through Chinatown? Why, why, are, why are there tenements? Why are there Chinese food places? Why is there dim sum? And piles of garbage? Uh, here, why, why isn't there a huge pond? Why is there skyscrapers right down there? Big Dog says, this is a live stream is great. Keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate you. Big Dog, thank you so much for a super chat. So, all this was drained. It was drained because back in the late 1700s, tanneries were starting to set up right by Collect Pond. If anyone knows what tannery is, it's basically making leather. And when you make leather, there's a lot of waste, blood, guts, and gore from animals. Also, the city was growing quickly and more and more people were moving into the city. By the late 1700s, maybe some of those immigrants were Germans or Scottish. And they started moving closer to the pond. Also freed Africans as well were moving around the pond. And as the conditions got poorer and more denser, people started defecating, started throwing their defecations into the pond, their poo. And the pond ended up smelling terrible. And remember, this was also the age of the horse. So there was also a lot of defecation from the horses. And they would even put dead horse bodies into the pond to dispose of them. Because it was the easiest place they can do it. So the entire place the smelled, had a terrible stench. It was a rancid, polluted, brown body of water. Well... In 1811, they decided to build a canal to drain the pond so they can eventually put landfill. 
So we're walking on poop land, says uh, Sami. In a way, you can think about it. Uh, Danny says, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Danny, how about this? I'll make you an offer that you can't refuse. Slap that like button. And we'll be cool. We'll be cool. If you slap that like button. We'll be cool. Let me know. If you're cool, then we'll be cool. So now it's a popular area with a lot of Chinese Americans hang out. A lot of elderly Chinese Americans specifically. And there's always great, great um, music as well. Sometimes there's, uh, there's the guy playing the mandolin. The, uh, I might be getting the name wrong, but the Chinese guitar, really cool. Okay, so tell, tell, me, tell me if you're cool. And if you're cool, we'll continue with the story. We got one more. We got one more. Let's stop after this. So if you slap that like button and you're cool, and we're cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Melissa says like button snap, uh, slapped. Awesome. Um, 1811, this was landfill. A few decades later, as evidenced with St. Patrick's Cathedral, oh, the Basilica, that we saw earlier, by 1809, Irish were starting to come in. But they started coming in much more in droves a few decades later, 30s, 40s. And with all these Irish coming in, they were extremely poor, trying to flee from the terrible conditions of famine over in their mother country. Well, where would a poor Irishman move to? in New York City. Remember, New York City wasn't united with Brooklyn, so they couldn't move to Brooklyn. There was no bridges, so how would they even get here? They couldn't really commute to work because there was no rapid transit. They would have to take a horse, and horses are expensive. So the Irish had to live right by the factories. And where would they be the factories? The factories also had to be close to the factory owners. So the entire city was dense and close. It was all concentrated right below Chambers Street. The only place where a poor Irishman could afford was right outside Chambers Street, right here at what used to be the former Collect Pond landfill. And thus they set up on a intersection of five different streets, what became known as the most dangerous neighborhood in the world, Five Points. And inside Five Points, Irish grand gangs roam free because many Irishmen were also unemployed. They had a terrible time finding jobs because there were these huge signs that would read, no Irish need apply, which means Irish were not allowed to take those jobs. Irish were seen as other in a very significant way, in a very significant way, as we've done with many other ethnic groups here in the U.S. It happens in many other countries around the world, so the um, U.S. is not the only one that has done this. So these are where gang battles transpired. People like the Bowery Boys, those American-born Protestants hated the Irish because they were starting to take over their jobs. And one of the guys that hated the Irish the most was because he was starting to take the jobs of the butchers. His name was Bill Poole. Bill Poole is also known as Bill the Butcher. He's the main character played in Gangs in New York starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Leonardo DiCaprio plays an Irishman. Uh, there's a lot of Italians playing Irish. I don't know why they hire Irish Americans to play Irish. Uh, Cauliflower, thank you so much for your $10 super chat. You're so kind. Thank you so much. So this is Bill the Butcher. Uh, another mustache. We got a lot of mustaches here. And Bill the Butcher was in cahoots with this guy over here, Tanami, uh, or the, who ran Tanami. His name was Boss Tweed. But the Boss Tweed also had his hand with the Irish community. He coerced the Irish community to vote for Democrats over and over and over again. They would instruct the Irishmen to grow full beards, vote, shave off their beard, keep their mustache, vote again, shave off their mustache, and vote for a third time. 
And that's why this guy was the most corrupt politician in all of New York City. So a lot of stuff happened right here in Five Points. But Five Points by the 1890s was a very derelict neighborhood. The worst, most densely populated neighborhood in all of New York City. People did not like it at all. So what happened? Well, let's go and see some photographic evidence. A uh, lion, indeed. I won't get into that, but indeed, indeed. You got it right, lion. So, this man right over here by the name of Jacob Rees immigrated from Denmark in 1870. He was in search for a job as a carpenter, but he couldn't find any. So he lived in the poorest areas of New York City trying to find a job until he befriended a dog and that dog was beaten to death by the police officers. After that, he was on the vendetta against the corrupt system of New York City's law enforcement and also against poverty. Jacob Reese started writing articles for major newspapers against poverty, exposing the terrible things that happen with poverty, especially due to corruption, both on the political spectrum and also on law enforcement. But he found out that articles weren't doing anything. So he decided to make photographs, which was a new invention. And with this new invention, he also had the flash. And this is the book he ended up making, the How the Other Half Lives, published in 1890. Jacob Rees took these photos. So first, actually, before I go into the photos, this is a depiction of what this area of Five Points used to look like, the five intersections. And let me show you his photos. So he shows men crammed into the tenements. And this entire area, Five Points included, was a kind of all known as the Lower East Side. So some of these photos might also have been taken in the Lower East Side, but some have been taken right where we're standing. Here is the shacks behind the tenements. Children sleeping right by the vents. Now, he was using a huge flash, so he was able to take photos in these dark tenements. They barely had windows. The windows were tiny. They, they didn't have electricity. And they didn't light up candles as much because they were afraid of fires. So whenever he would take a photo, they would all be startled. Some of them in a drunken stupor, wondering what the hell happened. And that's why you see a lot of shocked faces with this. And another one was this one. This one is probably his most famous photo. This is a place right around where we're standing called the Bandit's Roost. Bandit's Roost. Jacob Reese was terrified of taking a photo here. He said that luckily the flash started them, startled them. So they, you know, were frozen, were confused that he had enough time to take the photo and leave. But why? Well, let's get a closer look. All these men, he said, were wanted for murder. They hung out in this area the bandits roost. Now one of the gang leaders was actually an Italian American towards more towards the 1890s. His name, I might be mispronouncing this, Vaseli, Va Vakeli, Va Va Vacaseli, something along those lines. But he didn't like his original Italian name. He also admired the Irish and wanted to fit in. So he named himself Paul Kelly. Paul Kelly, under his wing, had men like um, Luciano, like Al Capone, and many gangsters that ended up becoming very famous in the 1920s. This guy was their mentor. This guy was their Darth Vader. Their Sith Lord, <laughs> if I were to use a Star Wars comparison. Uh, this guy 
was their leader. All starting right here. Paul Kelly's main nemesis was Monk Eastman, a Jewish gangster. And here's Paul Kelly's gang, right over here. We, talk, we already learned about Lucky Luciano. So Lucky Luciano, one of his gang members, and this was one of his headquarters. So, what happened? Well, the violence got so bad, the stench, again, got bad. We were already on top of, as Hisami said earlier, we're on top of poop land. The poop came back, and it smelled even worse. And there was a lot of crime, and devastation, and derelict buildings, and crumbling, sinking buildings. There was a main building right in the middle of Five Points that was actually sinking down. It was a, the brewery depicted in the film Gangs of New York. Well, the city decided to demolish the entire thing and build this park. Known originally as Columbus, as Mulberry Street Bend Park, or the Mulberry Bend Park. Built in 1897 by Calver Vo, who is known for Central Park fame. However, before we go to our next stop, our last one, this is still associated with uh, something else that's considered dirty. This is also known as New York City's rattiest park. At night, well, not in the past like year because they've done a very good job in exterminating, but if you were to walk here years prior, at night, you would see a bunch of little rats scurrying all around. So the poop, poop returned. Yes, indeed, <laughs> Yoli. Poop came back. All right, so yeah, a lot of Chinese gamblers um, don't want to get too close and show their faces. The rattiest park. Rattiest mean uh, the most rats. It's the park with the most rats. Used to be. Not so much more in the past year. The city has actually done a very good job in, in exterminating them. So there was one other group in the film Gangs of New York. Let me know if you've seen Gangs of New York. Uh, in Gangs of New York, they depicted Irish. They depicted the American-born Protestants, which were known as, they called themselves nativists. Uh, by Daniel Day-Lewis. They depicted some Italians, I think. Uh, and they also depicted African Americans. But there was one other group. What was that other group that they depicted? And here's a hint. It was in the scene where the main character, Leonardo DiCaprio, goes into an opium den and sees a huge production. What group was that? The other group to finish off those five groups that we've been talking about this entire broadcast. And yes, Mel, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about African-American history here uh, next week. Stay tuned, because there's more history on the other side of uh, this park. That's for another video. That's right, the Chinese. Welcome to Chinatown. The very first Chinese person and I'm not going to use the word immigrant for a very good reason. To move here was in 1857, 1858. His name was Ah Ken. He was, uh, a lot of people claim that he's the first one. But he wasn't an immigrant. Ah Ken came over from the West, from San Francisco area. A lot of the Chinese that followed Ah Ken, mostly in the 1870s when uh, there was a few thousand Chinese, around 7,000 Chinese living here, were mostly from the West. They were not coming directly from China. They were already Americans, uh, maybe not by citizenship, but they were already living here for many years, maybe even a decade or two. These men were also 
had some money. They had some money, so they were able to start businesses like laundromats and food and buy some real estate. But why did they come from the west to the east when a lot of Irish Americans and Italian Americans would come here to New York, settle down in Five Points or Little Italy, and then go over to to Pennsylvania, to the Midwest, and then later to California. Why were the Chinese doing the reverse? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the Irish and also the Protestant American born in California were starting to persecute the Chinese because they said that they were taking away their jobs. They weren't welcomed in San Francisco, in LA, in many towns along the West. And thus the Chinese were lynched, killed, murdered, sued, everything under the sun in order to keep them out. And when Ah Ken came over here and realized, oh, wait a minute, there's not that much persecution happening here, the Chinese followed. But with that followed their underworld the crime syndicates that ran the Chinatowns of San Francisco. These crime syndicates were known as the Tongs. Now, the Tongs had more severe methods than even the Cosa Nostra and the Italians. This is Pell Street. One of the main streets of the Chinese tongs. Here's a photo of what it used to look like. Let's cross the street. In the distance, you would see the elevated of the Bowery. The Bowery is another broadcast on its own. This already tour is already getting to two hours, but the bar is already another broadcast on its own because it has a crazy history. Here's a depiction of Chinese men, Chinese Americans at that, t at that point when the photo was taken. The businesses along Pell. The Tong have families also. Yes, indeed, they did. There's another photo. Ina, you're a new viewer and you uh, pushed that like button. Yes, thank you so much, Ina and Team Like. Cauliflower says, great content again and historical info. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Ooh, I'm so glad we're getting so many uh, views. That's so awesome. And people tuning in. I'm so glad. History, history is awesome. That's amazing. So go a little bit further down. Now this was one of the original streets where the Chinese who started coming here in the 1860s, 1870s settled down. They were host of the opium dens and entertainment uh, for a lot of the Irishmen and other groups. This was neutral territory between the gangs of the Irish and uh, uh, nativists and African-Americans probably were involved slightly in that as well. However, one of the worst places in all of this tour is going to be right around the corner. At what was known as Murder Alley also known as the Bloody Angle. This was the most notorious gang battleground in all of New York City. Here's a photo taking us back into time. One day, According to legend, I can't really verify. A lot of these stories, just so you know, do your own research because uh, they can't always be 100% verified. 
A lot of that is hearsay. But one day, a gangster by the name of Mock Duck, who was the leader of the Hip Sing Tong. And remember, a Tong is like a Chinese mafia, a Chinese uh, gang. The Hip Sing Tong, Mock Duck, approaches a guy right over here on Doyer Street by the name of Tom Lee. He was the leader of the Oliong Tong. And he asked Tom Lee, hey, give me 50% of your revenue. That revenue came from opium den dealings, uh, from prostitution, from gambling, and from other businesses and racketeering. Well, Tom Lee, this guy over here, older than Mock Duck, laughed in his face. He, was, he said, oh, hell no, I'm not going to give you half of my money. You're crazy. How do you think I'm going to give you half of my money? So, Mock Duck pissed off. He's like, this guy over here, we only have two tongs over here, and you're messing with me. Come on. So, Mock Duck starts forming his revenge. Now, before this encounter, there was already a lot of uh, battling happening, but not here. And Bahar just became a member. Thank you so much, Bahar. Everyone give Bahar a very big round of hearts. Uh, and also Cauliflower for uh, leaving a su super chat. Thank you so much, Bahar. This, they used to usually fought everywhere else. And Mock Duck was known when he was shot, uh, when people would try to threaten him, he was known to have very long fingernails because Mock Duck did not get his hands dirty. But he was always armed with two pistols. And when, when they threatened him, not here on Doyer Street because this was neutral territory, they would attack him maybe on Pell, they would attack him maybe on Mott, but not here. Maybe on Bowery, but not here. This was neutral territory. Mock Duck would duck down, <laughs> as his name, and he, would, he was not known as a sharpshooter. He had very long fingernails, and he would just start shooting like crazy with both of his hands. A lot of the other gangs were so kind of freaked out by this guy and his brazenness by just docking down and just shooting like a madman that they, you know, they were afraid of him. So Mock Duck ended up gaining the respect of a lot of the Chinese here. However, Muck Duck wanted to gain revenge with Tom Lee for embarrassing him here on neutral territory in Doyer Street. There's a lot of people here dining out. How can you be embarrassed in front of all of them? Well, there was probably no dim someplace, but you get the idea. Well, right here, let's go to the Chinese theater. Right here, there, this, there's a chemist sign and it says, it's not an uh, original pharmacy. It's actually a speakeasy. Right next door is a modern restaurant called Chinese Tuxedo. It's actually based off the original Chinese Tuxedo, which I'll show you a photo of right here before I continue. Let me find it over here. Yeah, right here. And we got Nam Wa Tea Parlor, parlor right over here. Open in 1920. But we gotta go to August 7th, 1909, to five, all the way to about seven or eight Doria Street, nine Doria Street, I mean, to what used to be the Chinese Opera House. This is what we would look at back then. This Dory Street was the neutral territory, but even more so, the neutral hangout was the opera house, the Chinese theater. Here, both the Hip Sings by Mock Duck and the Oliongs by Tom Lee will hang out and watch the show together. Maybe they'll also be Irishmen, like Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's character and Bill the Butcher's character in Gangs in New York. It was too neutral territory just for everyone. But on August 7th, 1909, Mock Duck's crew, it's a very hot day, 
comes with long overcoats. A coat, basically as long as I have. So a very long coat. Comes with long overcoats. And it's summer. People are like, what the hell these guys are doing? Aren't you, aren't you hot? And they go inside, inside the theater, even more hot. So this is weird. They sit all the way in the front row. Behind them is the Oleong, Tom Lee's guys. During the show, one of them lits up a fuse. That fuse lets off a bunch of firecrackers. The audience is startled. Oh, wait, maybe, maybe it's part of the show. So they relax a little bit. But then they open up their coats, take out their guns, turn around and shoot all the Oleong Tong. All of Tom Lee's guys are massacred. What was known as the Chinese Theater Massacre here on Doria Street. After that, that unleashed the Tong Wars. And in the Tong Wars, it was an all out bloodshed. It wasn't quite like the Cosa Nostra where there was a specific code of honor. The Chinese didn't care. The Chinese would murder you on site in the middle of the street and cut you into pieces. They usually would fight in order to evade uh, anti-gun laws because sometimes getting a gun permit would be a pain for the Chinese Americans. They would use hatchets. And thus men would come here on Doria Street would be the main battleground because it was a double blind spot. I can't really see who's coming down this way. And if I were standing over there, I can't see who's coming down this way. So they would use to ambush each other. And thus they would take their hatchets in order to make a show of killing Q, the sirens, of killing one of the men. They would cut them into pieces and leave the hatchet in the skull. And thus that's where the name Hatchet Man comes from, which was used later to denote an assassin. Three Tong Wars ensued all the way to the late 1920s. But Mock Duck, what happened to old good Mock Duck? I don't know what happened with Tom Lee, but Mock Duck, we do know what happened. Mock Duck was arrested and he served two years in Sing Sing prison in upstate New York. But somehow, for some reason, I don't know how, Mock Duck retired and moved out into Brooklyn lived out the rest of his days all the way until he died in 1931. I don't know how this man did it. But how did he survive even these Tong Wars? Well, one of the ways he could have survived was going through one of these doorways. Now the doorways are a little bit hard to get to nowadays, but these doorways lead to tunnels. Tunnels that lead all around Chinatown, but one of the tunnels led right out to Chatham Square. Mock Duck probably used those tunnels, Tom Lee as well. You could probably visit those tunnels if you know one of the businesses uh, under there. Uh, but nowadays they really don't like tourists going down there. So I haven't seen it in years. But I did visit it back in like 2009. It was really cool. Well, good for Mock Duck. Despite his heinous crime, he managed to get away with it. Don Gotti wasn't quite so lucky. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, are the mafias and the gangsters of New York. Are they still around? Yeah. The Hip Sing Tong and the Oleon Tong are actually Chinese neighborhood associations, both in San Francisco and also here in a few other Chinatowns. Well, Don Gotti probably is in hard, doing hard time. I'm not sure if he's still alive or he passed away, that I'm unclear, but he was unable to have any contact with his family. For many years, he only had once in 1998. And the Mafia still exists in some way, but we really don't know how because their methods haven't been so obvious. Maybe they follow more the path of Paul Castellano with more white collared crime, dealings more with Wall Street and real estate. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. I hope you enjoyed this tour. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. John Gotti died, okay, thank you. Thank you for letting us know, uh, I was unaware. I hope you enjoyed this uh, tour and uh, I'll be back for more videos every 1 p.m. Saturdays and Wednesdays. <laughs> Someone's giving me a thumbs up.
<laughs> keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Petter, for the uh, 100, 100 Swedish Krona. And thank you, Michael, for the $7 um, super chat. I appreciate you. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye. I'm going to head over into the tunnels.